Good morning, and welcome to our final Focus Friday of this semester. We are happy to have each of you here with us. My name is Garrett Steed. I'm one of the managing directors of Partners in Business. And again, we welcome you to this, uh, this Focus Friday for this week. Uh, we have a phenomenal uh, opportunity today to have Alan Hall with us um, from MarketStar, uh, founder and CEO. Um, we're excited to, to have him and to hear from him uh, today for our leadership forum. So just a few announcements before we introduce Alan. Um, again, this is our last Focus Friday of the semester. Uh, our next Focus Friday will be on January 19th uh, for, the, for the, our spring semester. Also, uh, just so that you know that the B&B Roundtable is on December 1st. And then even if uh, you haven't registered um, for the Tech Talk today, the XL Tech Talk, um, you can still go down um, directly after the Leadership Forum at 1130. And that goes from 1130 to 1215. Um, and that's in Huntsman Hall, room 320, and there's lunch included in with that. So to go ahead and get us started with uh, our today's uh, leadership forum, again, we're so excited and thrilled to have Alan Hall here with us, serial entrepreneur, angel investor, community advocate, an adjunct professor, and philanthropist. Uh, he teaches a lot of the MBA pro or with the MBA program at Weber State, um, as well as founder and chairman and former CEO of Market Star Corporation which was founded in 1988. The company generates billions of dollars for clients, including Hewlett Packard, Cisco, Sony, Intel, Verizon, and Google, and many others that they, that they participate and have clients with. He's the founder and chairman of Grow Utah, a non-for-profit entity with a mission of stimulating economic development through entrepreneurship. He and his wife are the parents of six married children and 18 grandchildren. And something that, that he mentioned to me is that, they lo that he loves uh, speaking with, with students. And so we have the pleasure and opportunity to have him. So we, I, we encourage you, take out a pen, take out some paper, write down some notes, some things that we can then apply within our own personal leadership. Please give us a warm welcome from the Huntsman School of Business to Alan Hall. Can you all hear me okay? Volume good. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to come on campus today. Uh, it's, this may be a difficult speech for me because I think I'm just going to look out the window <laughs> for the next little while. What a, what a view. Your campus is beautiful, and I'm always honored to come up to this uh, magnificent institution. I know President Albrecht real well. I've been associated with him for many years in a role I've had where I've been the chairman of the board of Weber State University for a number of years and was uh, pleased to have the opportunity to come and visit with him and the other trustees of this institution. You're led by great leaders. You obviously have a new president coming in, but your trustees are first class. And I recognize all the good work that's going on here for, your, for you great students. And I'm grateful for a faculty, a world-class faculty, that's here to teach you uh, the fundamentals of, in this case, business. So I have a special presentation to give you today. This is my, I think, Nicole, it's like speech number 50, isn't it? So I like to go out and give speeches all over the world, and, but in Utah, this is the place that I treasure the most, and I like to come and give speeches to students that will really benefit you. So today I'm going to depart from what I normally talk about. You know, I generally speak on leadership or entrepreneurship or sales or marketing or running businesses. Uh, today I really want to deliver something that will be most meaningful to you. And so I've, I've selected this topic on principles that will m really maximize your career. In the course of being in business for these literally almost 50 years since I graduated in 1969 from Weber State, I have been involved obviously in business for all these many years and I've tried to maximize my particular time within any organization no matter what that might be. So today, I, I hope what I'm going to present to you is a gift, a gift that will really help you to maximize your career. Now, you might think of this in not only ways that will appeal to you in the business world, but some of the principles that I'll teach you today also will apply in your life as a, as a person as well. So let's talk today primarily about how you might maximize your business experience. By, by show of hands, how many are business majors, right? Are all of you pretty much business? Are there any of you in here who uh, are minors? Raise your hand if you're a minor. But most of you today 
are going to pursue some sort of a employment opportunity that you hope will bring you happiness and fulfillment. So I want to share with you then basically 11 principles that I believe will help you to maximize that experience. And I'm going to be very frank with you because you can make big mistakes when you go out to get a job. And it's not about just finding a job that will pay you and sometimes pay you well. It's really about what will make you happy in that opportunity that you seek. So if you will, let's go through then a, a little bit of my background. And the, the picture of this is relevant. This is me. This, this is, uh, what's his name? Iron Man, yeah. So right in the center of his chest, I have one right up here on my left side chest. I have a pacemaker. And it was recently put in there so that I can live forever. <laughs> I don't know if I want to live forever, uh, but I, I'd still be giving speeches, wouldn't I? But my point is, is that in my life, I want to maximize everything I do. And I found out my health was dropping a little bit, that my heart rate had gone down, where I was listless and tired, needed a nap. The physicians put this in me, and I feel like I'm 18 again. <laughs> and so I'm sort of like, man, this stuff about uh, maximizing your life is good when you feel well. I won't go into today to what my future looks like, but I'll tell you I'm still going to be doing things 20 years from now with just as much passion and energy and fire as I have in the past. So I'm happy to share with you some things that will work. I want to just go quickly down this little list uh, about myself so you'll, you'll sort of see that I have some authority to speak on the topic of how to maximize your life. So I've always been an entrepreneur. That entrepreneur thing has been in me since I, I uh, was a, a lad. And uh, is anybody from BYU in the room right here today? Anybody? Because I'm going to offend BYU ever so lightly. <laughs> when I went to BYU to get my MBA back in 1972, they'd never heard of the word entrepreneur. And I was an entrepreneur. They wanted me to go to work for Mobile Exxon or Procter & Gamble. They wanted me to go to work for the big corporations because that's what an MBA student was all about. That's what a business student should pursue. And I recognized, oh, I'm not going to go to work for a big company. I'm going to be my own boss. I'm going to do and follow my own dreams. I don't want to have to wait for 40 years to lead a big business. I'm going to do it now because I'm going to be the entrepreneur that is in charge. So you're looking at a guy who is sort of the antithesis of corporate America, although I've been involved in it. I'm very much an entrepreneur who wants to do my own thing, and I continue to want to do that. If you're like me, corporate America is not the place for you. But if it is, I want you to think about being an entrepreneur, an intrapreneur inside of the business is where you'll go to work. So I come from a background of entrepreneurship, not a sort of a corporate orientation. Market Star has been a remarkable opportunity for me. It was the seventh company I started, and the first one was successful, then the others were failures until I got to Market Star. There's something to learn from failure, and that failure is that Take what, understand what happened, and then try and build upon it to not do it again. And Marcus Star turned out to be a company that came out of the failure of a, one I had started previously. But this one took off. And it took off because there was a marketplace for what we do. Market Star is basically an outsourced marketing and sales company. So Intel, Google, HP, any of the sorts of companies that are looking for sales into the channels globally is what we do. At one point, we were at about 6,000 employees worldwide evangelizing the products of Microsoft. We launched the BlackBerry, which led me into some other things I'll share with you briefly. But the concept of MarkStar was an entrepreneurial success. There was a market for the product and service that we had to offer. We generate about $8 billion a year on behalf of 30 large technology companies. 
a very simple business model. We are salespeople, and we become the salespeople for large companies. We wear the badge of HP, and yet we work for MarketStar Corporation. So I come with a background of having sold that business, having become wealthy, having become part of a publicly traded company, and learning the ins and outs of what makes companies work and how they are successful or how they become companies that fall out of sorts with the customer. One of the things that uh, I learned as I've gone through this experience is that uh, once I made money, I decided to invest in other entrepreneurs. I have basically 40 investments in Utah companies where entrepreneurs came to me with an idea and technology and said, Alan, would you give us some money to grow those businesses? I did. Of those 40, there are four left. 36 of them are gone. I lost money on 36 of those companies. I have four left, and dang it, I better get my money back on those four. <laughs> so my wife thinks of me as a riverboat gambler. Yeah. And so basically I take risks investing in companies with the hope that they might succeed and in return give me the money back so that I can put that money back into the system and continue to invest in new companies. I decided one day to be a venture capitalist, which is sort of a step up from an angel investor. And we started a firm called Mercado Partners. If you go online and look at Mercado, it's one of the top five best performing funds of the year 2007. We have returned almost five times people's investment capital with an annual IRR of close to 60%. So we've been very successful in investing other people's money into high growth companies that have done well. And we've done that because we married the idea of marketing and sales with true venture capital, something that had never been done before. So Mercado's successful in that we drive revenues. And if there's one lesson I would teach you today about business is there is no business without revenues. And those revenues should have margins in them to cover overhead costs to make sure that you're profitable. Because I made wealth and because I recognize that uh, I am not the one responsible for the success, although I put my time and energy into it, I Ladies and gentlemen, give credit to God who gave me an opportunity to be a steward over money, a manager over money, not the owner of the money. Now, the IRS does believe that I own all this money. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But in the way I look at it, I'm a, I'm a steward of God's money to do good with the money. So my wife and I founded uh, the Hall Foundation with the idea that we would take this wealth and we'd use it to bless the lives of the poor here in Utah and in other parts of the world. The theme of our foundation is that there be no poor among us. And the idea then is I see myself having learned to be the manager of a, of a machine that makes money, whatever that business might be, with the intent that I can have some for myself I don't need a lot, but that I'll take that surplus money and we will donate it and give it away to bless those who truly need some help. Now, if I were to leave you with a timeless formula, it is this. Is that if we focus on God helping us, God helps us to be successful in our lives with the intent that we will help those who have need. And yes, we might be that. But the intent is, if you students will keep this always in mind, is that God will bless you to bless the lives of other people. And there's no reason in business that we can't pray and ask for divine help to be successful in the businesses that we are a part of. So take that one and remember how important that is. Today, not only do I hope to give money away, but I'm also trying to educate people. So I, I, I'm pleased that Weber State's allowed me to be an adjunct professor, so I teach courses in sales and entrepreneurship and anything else that the university wants me to do with the idea that I can continue to give back. 
The thing I favor the most right now is to be a community advocate. Uh, so I'm chairman of Ogden Pioneer Days. I oversee the rodeo and all the things that are going on in Ogden relative to that. I'm involved with the Union Station Museum, with education across the state of Utah. Anywhere I can give back is what's important to me right now because, again, I'm trying to maximize my life. I'm trying to use the resources that I have to be successful. So that's, that's a little bit of my background of why I hope you'll listen to me as I talk today about you being successful in your own lives in a business career. So let me go to principle number one. <clears throat> uh, by the way, this slide deck, I think uh, we can make it available to all the students. So you won't have to necessarily take notes on the slides. You might want to put something down, an impression you have as I speak, but we'll make sure that you have the slide deck so you'll see the bullet points. Join the right company. If you're going to be happy, if you're going to be fulfilled in your business career, it starts with affiliating with the right company in the first place. Way too many times, people go to work for a company where they don't make it very long and they fall off their horse. They want to leave. They're unhappy. They're dissatisfied. And it starts, my friends, with we make a bad decision. We need to make the right decision day one of where we're going to go to work. So I've listed on the screen for you the following things. It's called the seven C's of finding the best employment. I have a book on Amazon called The Seven C's of Hiring. It's meant for employers to use these seven points when they hire you. But today I want to flip that. And I want you to think you're going to interview the business that you seek to have hire you, and you're going to consider these seven points. Is that fair how I'm describing it? They're looking at you this way. You're going to look at them in a mere reverse. So let me go through the seven points for you as you look at a company. So the first thing they want to look at and you want to look at is, are you competent to take the job that's being offered to you? Are you good enough to meet the expectations? Are you able to perform? Your resume that you send in generally will list the things that you can do. An employer looks at what you have to offer versus what that job description is, and they try and marry those together. So the first thing I would have you do is look at that company and say they've got an opening in this particular uh, part of their business. I've looked at it, and you know what? I can do that. I can do that, and I can do that really well. That's a good start, because if you're going to go into that business, you want to perform at the highest level you can. So you're not going to take a job you can't do very well in. That would be falling off the horse, wouldn't it? Easy. I match what they want me to do. Two, am I capable to grow? Can I take this job and will within this business, will they provide me the opportunity to optimize it, to maximize the job so that I can one day be promoted? Or am I going to be in this job forever and never really move forward? I want to go to work for a company that will see my attributes, see my qualifications, and they basically will say, you're so good, Alan, we think we'll give you more opportunity. Don't go to work for a company that doesn't value your contributions and won't let you move on. Now, I'm going to tell you how we gather the data on this as I get to the end of this particular slide. The third thing, and the most important thing for me, is am I compatible inside that business? Do I have the chemistry where being around the people, uh, I'm going to be accepted? Now, uh, my wife teases me from time to time that I've fired so many people in my life because I was not compatible with them that I could never run for governor. So, too bad. You're never going to see me as governor because I don't have enough people who will vote for me. Why did that happen? 
it's because I did not at the time recognize how important harmony was with my employees. How important it is that I get along with the people with whom I work. It is really important. It doesn't mean that I can't disagree, that we can have differences of opinion, or even have, you know, a hard time coming to a conclusion, but I need to be able to like them. They need to be able to like me. So when you go to work somewhere, you're going to go into an environment where if people don't like you, you're not going to be able to be fulfilled. You're not going to be happy because they're going to put you down. They're going to do things to harm you because they don't like you. Compatibility is a huge part of your success in business. Don't go to work in a company that, where you are not going to be well received. Number four, character has to be with honesty, integrity. We don't want you to be a character. We want you to have character. Now, you may go into a business with honesty and forthrightness and virtues, but what about your employer? Is their value such that they cheat, that they lie, that they do inappropriate things? And in some cases that they ask you to do things that you know are wrong? It's a choice you're going to make. But I would never go to work. I would never recommend that you go to work inside of an institution, inside of a business that is not truthful. It's not an honest entity. How often do we see on the news a company that's done something that uh, breaks the law? They're criminals. You don't want to go to work inside of an institution that you know, as you do your homework, you find out that is, this is a wicked place. Don't go there. Culture is probably the most important thing as you look inside the business. The term culture for means is, means how we behave with one another. Your home has a culture. Your neighborhood does. Your ball team does. Your church does. Everywhere we go in life, there's a way we behave and how we treat each other. You want to look at a culture where it's one of acceptance, of, of teamwork, of helping one another accomplish the goals. Uh, I won't give the name of this company because I don't know how far this little presentation will go, but uh, at Marcostar one day we were engaged with a significantly global software company. And I went into a meeting where the culture of how they treated each other was adversarial, was uh, based upon attacking your idea, where they would put you down. The goal was that this process would refine one another to the point that they would come out with the best answers. I watched as some of the men and women following the meeting walked out of the room having tears in their eyes and choked up. They were in those meetings, knew exactly what was going to happen as they made their presentations, but they got beat up. The culture, in my mind, was, man, I don't want anything to do with this company. Because if they treat their employees this way, which was by design, I don't want to be treated that way. That's not a culture with which I want to be associated. How do people treat one another is culture. Committed. Are they committed to you? Are they going to make sure you, they're going to do everything they can to make sure you stay in the business and are growing? Are you committed to stay with them? Are you there just for a short period of time or are you there for the long haul? You want to understand if those companies are there for you and are committed to making sure you're successful. Seven, compensation. Are they going to pay you appropriately? And most companies in today's world, if they're going to get good people to come to work for them, very clearly will pay you the wages and benefits that you need. Those are the seven. I would have you do your homework on the companies that you look to seek employment from based upon these seven. Now you can go online if you will. I think my book is 99 cents. Buy as many as you can. The Seven C's of Hiring. It's a 20-page book that goes into more detail on this, but just flip it 
in terms of how you look at it. Now, how do I get this information? What I tell a company to do about you is this. Contact your boss, contact your peers that you work with, contact your subordinates and say, were they competent, capable, compatible, ta 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 And what will happen is there may be a yellow flag that comes up that you weren't so compatible or you weren't so honest, that employer is going to look at that and say, you're probably not going to surface into the top pool of candidates. So we can find out about employees by doing these sorts of surveys. What I would ask you to do in the flip version is I would have you talk to current employees and say, if I go down this list, tell me about your company as they measure up on these seven points. Talk to former employees who now have left. Find out how that company operates so you get enough intelligence to know you're going into the right firm. Everybody understand what I'm talking about? Do your homework. Okay. Hope, th hope this is helpful to you. Let's go to the next slide. This is a key that I want to share with you uh, so you'll, again, make a good choice on companies because this is so fundamental to where you're going. Harvard professors teach a thing called a service profit chain. And uh, I've operated using this fundamental lesson for many years. And it's basically this. We're going to hire the best employees based upon the seven C's. We are going to give you a culture that lets you blossom. We are going to take care of you. We're going to pay you well, benefits, educational improvement opportunities, promotions, rewards, incentives, recognition. We're going to take care of you. Because you know what? We know you'll take care of our customer. If I take care of you, I know you'll take care of the clients that we have. And those customers, if we take care of them, they will reward us with ongoing business, they'll make referrals, and our company will be profitable. That's called the service profit chain. Most of my life in the entities where I'm involved, this is what we do. We take care of our employees. They're the most important asset we have. The company I talked about that was bad, they were the opposite of this. They beat their employees up. If you go into any retail business or any place where they take care of a customer, if that clerk, if that employee does not treat you well, I can tell you that they are not treated well by that company because we reflect what our management does to us. Find a company that follows this sort. You okay? Everybody okay so far? Let's keep going here. Next slide. Surprise and delight your boss would be really important for you to be successful in your business. Surprise and delight. We don't want to surprise them in a negative way, do we? We don't want them to be, oh my God, why didn't you tell me about this earlier? This is a surprise where you perform so well that they are ecstatic that you have done this on such a timely basis, on budget, on time, and you've done it in the most positive way. You delight your boss. Now, some of you, based on culture, might have a boss that treats you not so well. But the idea is that you're going to make the choice to always exceed their expectations. You're going to go beyond the mark to make sure that you're delivering what that boss wants and more. You're going to go beyond the mark. So keep in mind that bosses are the ones that provide us with opportunities. They're the ones that give us the, the things of the future in terms of advancement and additional things that we will also enjoy. So think to yourself every day, I'm going to make sure my boss is so happy with me and you will be happy yourself. Uh, that happens to be a couple, of, that's my daughter, a granddaughter, and a daughter-in-law, a little off to the left, that's a daughter. I took them to New York, and uh, we took them over to the Shake Shack. And that picture tells me that Grandpa uh, surprised and delighted those wonderful girls in my family, right? Surprise and delight. Next one. Be innovative. 
In today's world, those employees who really succeed and find this happiness and joy in their employment are thinkers. They think outside the box. They think big, bold, and bodacious. They're trying to figure out how to solve problems. And they raise their hand and they say to their boss, they say to their peers, I see we have an issue or a problem inside of our department or inside the company. Let's fix it. Let's do something to improve upon that. Think about those employees in the eyes of a boss who says, we'll figure out a way. We'll figure out a solution. That person's going to be rewarded because they're thinking in a way to make improvements in the enterprise. There isn't a single business that I know of that doesn't need to have continuous improvement. And if you're innovative, thinking of what might be done to fix things, then do that. Now, I, I think it's really important as you go through this particular process of innovation that you seek to involve others in the conversation. Don't be selfish. Think about being inclusive, being participatory. Think about bringing in diversity of thoughts and ideas. Make sure that there's a host of people thinking about what might make things work. So it's a, it's a spirit of humility, if you will, about I think I've got a way we could address this, but I don't have all the answers. But I'm willing to raise my hand to get us together to start to figure out what we might do to make this thing work. That spirit of collaboration is the key for innovation. And a team of no more than about 10 people can always come up with the best possible solution. But everyone needs to be involved in that particular solution. So think innovatively. Let's go to the next one. OK, good. It's all working, isn't it? Nicole Glom is my executive assistant. And Nicole makes sure that uh, I show up on time, that I come to surprise and delight you. Thank you, Nicole. How else? Can we make sure that you maximize your business experience, your career? It's to build great relationships with everybody in your business. Everybody. You want to be known as a friend to everybody that you come in contact with. You want to be there to sort of make sure that their needs are met. You want to be there to take care of them. Now, all too often what happens in business that tips it over is we are sort of egocentric. We think we know all the answers. Uh, we think we have the best solutions. And we actually compete in a business setting where we compete against each other. That, my friend, is not the way to win friends and influence people. Don't compete with each other. Be cooperative. Help each other. You'll move on if you take an attitude of we'll work as a team. We'll work together. I may be smarter than all of you in your room, but I'm certainly not going to tell you that. I want us all to work together. So finding and helping others in your business is the key. Not only your boss, your peers, and your subordinates. The whole idea is to always be complimentary, to never offend one another, to be respectful and courteous, and always be a listener. Now, hopefully, all of you in this room have this sort of innate attribute that you can be a friend, that, can, that you can help one another in the cause, and not be there to one-up your peers. Be there to help each other, and you'll find that you will soar inside that business. Next one. One of the other principles for you that I think will help you in your business a lot is the idea that you know your customers. Now, I'm going to break this into, as you'll see here, there are internal customers. We'll talk about them for a minute. And then there are external customers. Customers are people with needs that require a solution. So I want you to think that you want to know the needs of your boss. And I can tell you this, that most bosses worry about certain things that keep them awake at night. And it 
eats at them because they're not taking care of some things that are important. What are they worried about? What's keeping them awake? If your boss will share with you because you've established a friendship, perhaps that boss will tell you what is giving them anxiety. You want to help your boss. You want to help that guy or gal so that they don't have to worry at night because you're going you're to take care of something for them. The same applies to your peers. You have peers that are worried about stuff at home or their health or their own success. They're maybe not doing as well as they thought they would on that task. You know their needs. Not to harm them, not to compete, not to jump past them. You know their needs so that you can help them. They're customers. So I want to think, have you think inside that business, you're always thinking about the needs of others and how you might be a solution to help them so that they're okay. Clearly there are external clients and you want to know why your business has those customers. What's going on with them? What are their needs? What sorts of solutions do they need to have delivered to them? And part of that, those stakeholders are not only the clients that buy services and products, but it might be the vendors who sell you products. You want to understand their needs and how they think. And clearly, the banks that have relationships with your company. You want to understand what's going on inside the head of the bank. Last week, I had a vice president of a bank come and talk to the students in my entrepreneurial class about how a bank thinks. It was revelatory to the students to see how a bank thinks about they have to have a 98.7% return on their money to stay in business. They can't afford to have a, a loan go south. It just kills them when they do. Investors, we who invest in companies, want, we have our needs. And it's good for you, no matter what level in the business you are, to understand what's going on inside the mind of the investors, public and private, in your business. Okay, next slide. How are we doing for time? We're doing okay? I need to get wrapped up. Five, I got five minutes. So, let me see something here. Uh, see that? I invested in Skull Candy. You know why Skull Candy was a success? We knew everything about our customer. We knew everything about them. And therefore, we were successful because we knew about the product. Think about it. Know your product. Next slide. We're going to fly. Because I know you might have some questions. Oh, my goodness. Sell, sell, sell. How many of you in here are accountants? Raise your hand. Economic students, logistics, marketing, whatever. Let me tell you something. You're all salespeople. Write that down. <laughs> Tattoo it on your hand. I am in sales. Why? Because you have to sell yourself. You have to sell your boss on your idea. You have to sell your proposals. We're in sales. All of us are in sales. Don't forget it. I can spend more time on that, but just tattoo it on your hand. I am in sales. Next, mentors. Make sure you have people you can go to inside the business and out that will guide you, help you, give you direction, give you counsel to help you as you go through your career. It's good to have people inside that business who basically can tell you exactly how to overcome barriers and obstacles. Learn from them, listen to them, but get yourself a group of people who can be coaches and mentors to you. Number 10, isn't she pretty? Yeah, she has a cute little smile. So I want you to think every day at work, you have a smile. <laughs> you're happy, you're cheerful. None of us wanna work with grumpy people. Come to work prepared to be happy. You'll go far in business when you ha have a cheerful attitude. If you're grumpy, people will put you aside. Always remember, the cheerful employees are the ones that get that advancement and that opportunity. Last one, and then we'll take a few questions. Continue your education. I still study every day concepts in business and other things in life. I continue to read. I continue to take courses. 
I would suggest to you that as you graduate from this institution to continue to get a, uh, advanced degrees is relevant. Uh, in today's world with content as it is on the internet, I would continue to read and study using the tools and the resources that are out there. Our world keeps changing. You want to be current. You want to continue to be as educated as you possibly can. Your boss will know because you're smart when you sit in a meeting that you understand principles and concepts that were never taught to you here, but that you've picked them up on your own through the rest of your life. So be a student of education the rest of your life. Last slide. Beautiful building. I'm looking out this window. It's gorgeous. Thank you, Mr. Huntsman, other donors who made this building possible. I hope, did I do a good job? Is it okay? You all right? Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up for, for question and answer. Um, if you can stand up, say your name as well as your major. Let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Did I scare everybody? Okay, there you go. So my name is Barrett Hackler and I'm a marketing major. You're a proponent of ethical leadership and so I'm just curious, what are the, what's the process you go through when you come to an obstacle that challenges that ethical leadership? Hmm. What do you think it is? Keep the mark. Hopefully, you know, sitting back, kind of analyzing the whole, the, di the dilemma that you have, but just kind of curious on what, what the process is that makes it beneficial t to you and to your company. Yeah, I, I, I think to your point, uh, due diligence and trying to understand problems and issues and getting in to the weeds, if you will, really trying to understand how it starts. And then here's the key for me in terms of how to make a decision. An institution needs to have a vision of who you are, where you're going, and what you stand for. Now, based upon that, there may be times when I make a decision that's contrary to maybe everything else the business world thinks, but it fits with our values. Hobby Lobby, is that the group that decided they weren't going to open their doors on Sunday and had some other sort of things? They made a value-based decision based on politics and situations in our world. Businesses have to do that every day. Companies that sort of vacillate and don't quite get the thing right probably don't understand who they are and what they should be doing. Does that help you a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Great question, great question. Hey, my name's Chris, I'm a finance major. Did you actually speak at Snow College two years ago? I did, yeah. I saw you there. Ah, <laughs> how, how'd I do? Great, just okay. better different, this time. But different no, talk, good. right? So you talked about the importance of having your advanced degree. What advantage did that give you over entrepreneurs through your career? Mm. What advantage over an entrepreneur? Other entrepreneurs. Other entrepreneurs. Well, I, I think intelligence really guides us in terms of good decision making. An entrepreneur, a smart one, is, should be as educated as they possibly could be about the markets, their products. So education really applies to both. An entrepreneur that fails, like I did so many times, do you know what my failure was? I did the same mistake again and again. Do you want to know what it was? You won't hold it against me, will you? Because I've, I've, I've changed. I started with this cool idea of a product. And it consumed me. And I thought, it is such a cool idea. Everybody will want it. Everybody will want my cool idea. I did no marketing research. No, because it is a cool product. And I, I love it, and everybody will want it. Four times I did that. Do you know how many people wanted it? Nobody wanted it. So what was my lesson? The lesson that I eventually got to was do your homework on the market. Marketing research, understanding the customers, competition. Do all of that while you're thinking about how cool this is. You better find out if people really like that cool idea before you do anything on this. Think of it as an iterative process. You go to the customer base, 
You get their opinion on how cool your idea is. You go back and forth on features, benefits, pricing, back and forth, back and forth, until you finally get this figured out, but the customer base will now buy it, and there are plenty of them. I screwed that up four times. Four times. Sorry to tell you. Thank you. Good question. Alan, I have a question for you. Uh, just within your experience, you talk about doing research and uh, especially taking the time. We have many resources and tools with us. What is maybe a, a book or two that, that you've read recently or that you feel um, is helpful, helpful for us as students that, that we could read that's been helpful, helpful yeah. for you within your Yeah, life? yeah. How many of you have read Good to Great by Collins? You know, raise your hand on that one. I, I'd have you read Good to Great. That, that's a fundamental good one. I'd have you read a book that's a little bit esoteric. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's sort of a cultural business book, if you will. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And it talks about why businesses uh, tend to have great products, great markets, but they die inside because of the people. Read that one. Uh, but those are, those are two I would immediately come to mind that I think I'd have you entertain. Good question. Thank you very much. My name is Hayden Hubbard. I'm a biological engineering and economics major. And I, I wanted to ask about this idea with entrepreneurship. You talk about how you have to really know your market and understand what, what people want. How do you balance that, though, with your own personal values? Because sometimes maybe what, what's best, because you are well-educated and you have a lot of experience, isn't what people want. So how do you balance the market and values? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know if I've ever dealt with anything, but thank you for that sort of a notion. Um, you know, I would never sell anything that I didn't value, right? I would never sell something that was outside of my level of integrity. So I don't think I would ever go there. But at the end of the day, I, if there are people out there with a need of a certain thing and I can supply that and it meets their need and it's, let's say it's a, a value, a legitimate value to people, I think I'm okay with that. But there might be things out there where you'd say, that crosses a line, I don't think I'll go there. You might even work for an employer who might have a product or service that you don't believe in. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about, um, again, I don't dare give names. I'll be in prison by Monday if I do. So um, an, an, a financial institution, I sat on their board. Uh, they basically were all about selling so many financial products a day, and the, and the employees had quotas. The quotas got to be where they were far-reaching in terms of they couldn't be achieved. And so the employees were encouraged by their bosses to cheat. And they were going to sell things, they were going to mislead, they were going to false report. public found out about the company. And as I sat there and watched as reports were given to me as I was involved with this entity, I recognized that I couldn't work there. I resigned from the board because they were cheating as far as I was concerned. They were doing things, to your point, that crossed the line for me in terms of value. It happens. And you have to be prepared to make a decision to do something about it or leave. Great question. My name is Lincoln Archibald, uh, Marketing and Business Administration. You talked about all these different ventures that you started, uh, specifically for. I was just curious, were those usually internally or externally funded? Did you seek out funding, or how did you go about it? Yeah, that? no, good question. So uh, I've always funded them myself, even when I was just, you know, just an entrepreneur trying to do it. I always funded it myself. Uh, when I teach a class in entrepreneurship around funding of um, you know, angel investors, venture capital, banking, the very first line of uh, investment dollars comes from the person themselves. So it means you got to sell your motorcycle, you got to sell your couch, you know, you got to sell your own assets. Is this going where you're going? You got to sell and get your own money 
to start and grow your business, right? Because as an investor, uh, I don't want to put my money into your business if you haven't made the proper sacrifice. So with all my businesses, I, I have always put skin in the game to make sure that I was fully uh, engaged. And then investors would always look at me knowing I had given it my best. Good question. Hope I answered it well for you. We have time for one more question. Hi, Alan. Thanks for being here today. My name is Derek Morales. I'm a marketing major here at Utah State. Uh, you talked a little bit about a meeting in, uh, I believe you said Silicon Valley, where this company was argumentative and they were hurting others and kind of coming apart from the scenes as a team. Uh, today, it's really in vogue to have a lot of debate and push back on ideas. Where's the line for you? Can you go into more detail about that particular event? What's the difference between debate and an argument? Yeah, I, 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 let's put it this way. Um, I appreciate people with differences of opinion, and I, I want to hear it. I want to hear why they think that. I want it to be compelling, but it needs to be done with sort of a, an attitude or a spirit to it, and that, it, that it's not um, argumentative. It's not a fight. It's, uh, I've got some thoughts I want to share with you. So it's between the, the presenter and the listeners that it be done in a highly respected way. We're friends, and can friends have disagreement or opinion, and can they have those in a way where there's still harmony? Well, of, of course there, there can be. Where it crosses the line for me is there's someone in that room who wants to dominate, who wants to control, somebody who wants to take over. In, my life and within the world I have, we have a non-negotiable statement. And that is if you cross that line where you begin to want to take over or dominate, you're out of here. We don't tolerate it. It's unacceptable behavior. We can have every sort of disagreement on earth, but you will not become a dictator in this situation. So we actually do that. We hire people in the first place that won't do it, but you know ahead of time if you're going to get into that where it's argumentative because you're going to win because you're the boss, we dismiss you. We'll help you find a job somewhere else, but we cannot tolerate that behavior inside our business. Great question. This is the tough part of business, isn't it? This is when you get out there, you find this is the real world where you're going to have some days where it's tough. But I hope my counsel today about picking the right business in the first place We'll bless your lives and you'll have success. Thanks so much for your time today.